I know I don't need to remind you how dismal 2020 is. I'm so tired between the natural disasters and the pandemic and the fact that against my better judgment, I've uh, managed to become a full grown adult. I have decided to leave. I know what you're thinking. Meg, that sounds alarming. Don't worry. From now on, I will no longer be living in 2020. I will only be living in 2007. How, you may ask? Oh, well, darling, it's very simple. Of course, I already have a Spotify playlist with all the music I was listening to back then. And I only have to check back here to see what books I was reading back then. All I need now is the look, which I can easily achieve in three, two, I look incredible. So here we are everyone, 2007. I'm actually going to be describing all of the books that I reviewed um, in my first year of this book log. So as I've mentioned this before, I started this in August of 2007. So between August of 2007 and August of 2008, um, these are the books that I read. First, let me set the scene for you, all right? We're at the tail end of the Bush era. The first iPhone had just had its debut, but of course, I didn't care about that at all because all I wanted was a pink Motorola Razor. The biggest movies of the time were The Dark Knight, featuring um, Heath Ledger's iconic performance as the Joker, and of course, the cinematic masterpiece of our generation, High School Musical 2, featuring Zac Efron's iconic performance as preteen sex symbol. I'm telling you, I remember running through the streets of my town with my friends, screaming the lyrics to bed on it at the top of our lungs. I shopped at Justice and Limited 2 almost exclusively, but I do remember that every once in a while I could convince my mom to let me go into Hot Topic and just, just look. Because you know that scene, Emo Kid Aesthetic, was the iconic look of the day. Music, I was listening to lots of My Chemical Romance, um, Motion City Soundtrack, Boys Like Girls. Oh my god, I loved Boys Like Girls. The Beatles. The Beatles had a big resurgence in this era. Nobody remembers that, but like, Across the Universe came out. I had Beatles t-shirts, Beatles tote bags. I was obsessed. And as all of this was going on, the 2008 election was sort of playing in the background of my memory. I was 12, not old enough to vote. Though we didn't know it back then, we were unknowingly hurtling full speed ahead towards the 2008 financial crisis. For some reason, in my memories of this time, it's always fall, it's always autumn. And maybe that's because that like emo kid aesthetic that was so popular, like just inherently has that spooky October uh, feel to it. Or maybe it was because this really was the last gasp of that particular brand of suburban teenage ennui. I mean, this was like the final years before social media and school shootings and uh, financial crises really sort of redefined what it was to be a teenager in America. Before the pressure got dialed up to achieve, 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 and go to college and, and, uh, and, don't get murdered. I remember back then feeling so listless and unsettled. I remember fighting with my mom a lot because she just didn't understand. Jeez. And all I wanted was to like grow up out of all the kids stuff and have experiences and go to parties and self-express. So since that was so out of reach for me, or so I thought, um, I turned to books instead. Oh, I wanna quickly reframe this camera. I'm sorry, I still don't know much about filming, but I am trying to uh, get my face in that like two thirds of the way up place. Anyway, 
I read a lot of books at this time. So I'm going to pull out um, some of my favorites. These aren't going to be precisely recommendations the way that other videos of mine have featured recommendations. Instead, I want to talk about the books and why they meant so much to me at that time. Although if at any point you decide you want to read these books, please go ahead, we can talk about them. I do feel like we don't spend enough time recommending books that were trendy um, a long time ago. And it makes me wonder what books we have now that are actually going to stick around in a few years um, and what's just going to fall out of fashion. So here we go, opening to the very first page of this reading log. Let's see what we've got. Okay, right off the bat, on the very first page, we actually have two books um, written by two authors. Those are Dream Factory and Scrambled Eggs at Midnight by Bart Berkeley and Heather Hepler. Sorry, my handwriting back then was so bad. Yes, we're starting off strong with some teenage high school romance novels. Dream Factory was a romance about two people who were working um, as characters at Disney World. One of them played Cinderella and the other played Dale, as in Chip and Dale. Of course, they fall in love while exploring the Magic Kingdom. Um, they got to live the dream of being these like beloved characters while also being kind of apathetic towards Disney as a corporation and as a park. So of course, Little Angsty Me was all about it. And Scrambled Eggs at Midnight was also a teenage summer fling that involved fireworks and uh, green lipstick, I think. It's been a long time since I read these, so the exact details of the plot are a little bit hazy. But I do remember what was so enticing about these teenage romances was how full of feeling they were. Think about it, when you're a teenager and you're experiencing everything for the first time, it all seems so much and so fresh and so all-consuming. And it was about kids sort of stepping out of um, the expectations that their families had for them and um, coming into their own. Anyway, I loved these so much. It really kick-started um, another reading phase for me to excellent YA books. Another series that I absolutely loved was um, also about high school students. First one was called I'd Tell You I Love You, But Then I'd Have to Kill You by Allie Carter. This book was about an all-girls school um, of young women training to be spies. I really do miss this era of literature when everything was a school. School for magic, school for evil geniuses, school for spies, why not? Let's do it. Basically, the main character is like the daughter of this prodigy spy couple, and she has lots of high expectations put on her. And then she accidentally falls in love with this townie boy who doesn't know about her status as a spy, and she has to kind of keep her cover. And of course, all of her best friends are geniuses who kick ass and like come up with plots so that they can sneak out together. I read several of the books in this series and they were kind of popular. I remember Allie Carter getting a lot of buzz. What was so great about them was that I also had other friends who were reading them at the time. And so it was always like, oh, did you finish this book? Can I borrow the next one in the series? I remember being really... Um, disappointed when I was a kid because I just didn't feel like there was like enough media created for my age group. It was a way of bringing us all together around something totally uh, geeky and made kind of just for us, for girls our age. Another book I read at this time that I have read many, many times since is Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. I read this at first because I wanted to be a precocious kid, because I wanted to be the one in the corner reading classic literature while everyone else I thought was being shallow. I don't know. I know I had a not like other girls phase. I'm not proud of it. Let's just move on. Anyway, so I picked up Pride and Prejudice thinking I'd have to kind of struggle my way through it, um, but it was amazing. No one told me that classic literature 
was this fun. If you had told me that the characters were going to be this relatable, that uh, the plot was going to deal with uh, romance and drama and intrigue, I would have read it so much sooner. I did, you know, I remember reading it and falling in love with it. And since then, it just kickstarted my whole Jane Austen obsession. This was really the beginning of my love of classics um, and my love of Jane Austen specifically. As a young kid reading for this for the first time, um, you know, I was able to pick up on a lot of the humor and the biting wit that is so characteristically Jane Austen. I guess it made me realize that the gatekeeping was unnecessary, right? Like, just because something was put on a pedestal, Pride and Prejudice was seen as this uh, highfalutin thing didn't mean that I couldn't enjoy it as well. In fact, I sometimes think that Jane Austen is is written for teenage girls. Like, it's kind of about these super young women and their struggles. Basically what I'm saying is that if Jane Austen and I had lived at the same time, she totally would have run around town singing Bet On It with me and my friends. Totally. This was also the era where I read The Book Thief for the first time. I think this book now has become a modern classic. Um, a lot of students either read it for school or um, just because they like it so much. The fact that it's told from the perspective of death. Death is a character who is um, observing the events of the book, which of course takes place in Germany um, during World War II. This, I think, really captured uh, so many imaginations. It's not a happy story, but it is about children and it has sort of um, a lightness to it. That's not the word. An innocence to it that still comes across, I think, right? Like these children are growing up in this very harsh world at this very dangerous time. And they're not blind to those things, not at all. But that also doesn't stop them from being children. Anyway, I think it appealed to me so much back then because I too was walking that line between um, wanting to have a normal youth, a normal childhood, um, but also wanting to get on with the growing up process and understanding the world around me. And because the leading girl um, was a reader, that I related to. Another book I read that wasn't precisely fantasy, I suppose we would put it more in the um, speculative fiction realm. The book was called Elsewhere by Gabrielle Zevin. This book was first given to me by my friend Sarah. Yes, the same friend Sarah who I house it for last month. Friends forever. And it is about a young woman who um, dies and ends up in the afterlife. The whole premise of the afterlife is that you enter the world, the age you were when you die, and then you proceed to age backwards until you are a baby and you're ready to be reborn into life. So they had created this whole society of people who were slowly aging backwards. So you watch this young woman come to terms with her own death, with the fact that she will never see her friends and family again, but also realize that maybe she has a role to play in this new society. And then, not to spoil anything, <phone rings> look, I don't know anything about the afterlife, but I do uh, enjoy this whole premise. I wouldn't mind living in the world of elsewhere. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. I don't want this video to be too long. First, I want to talk about Katherine Gilbert Murdoch and her series, Dairy Queen story of a young teenage girl who lives on a farm in Wisconsin. She has a lot of responsibility. She's not only going to school, but she has to take care of the farm because her father, who normally runs it, is injured. She's a great athlete. She's been growing up playing sports with her brothers, and she decides, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to defy everyone in my town who thinks I shouldn't and try out for the football team. This is your Teenage Girls Can Do Anything book. This is, this book made me feel so cozy and safe. She goes from being kind of the quiet kid who doesn't have much to say, who performs her duties without problem, to causing quite a scandal. 
And of course she has uh, her cast of characters who support her, her quiet younger brother, the boy from the rival football team who maybe helps her practice, and of course her best friend. The book takes place in rural Wisconsin. Um, yeah, I, I, I have lived in rural Wisconsin. I, I know the environment there. It is. It is. Anyway, there's another reason why this book series means so much to me. I read it, I fell in love with it, and I wrote an email to the author, Catherine Gilbert Murdoch. I, you know, I was young, I was gushing about how I thought the love interest was so cute, but like, you know, I didn't like that he hurt her in this one scene, and oh my god, I love your book so much, it's so good. And she, I will never forget this, wrote back to me. She was so encouraging. She said that she was so appreciative that I read her books and that I love them so much. She encouraged me to be a writer. Um, and then, and then she asked if she could publish my email on her website under the fan mail. What a babe. What an iconic move. For me back then, this was like the most exciting thing that happened to me. I was like, this famous person is speaking to me. Yeah, and we kind of corresponded a bit back then. Oh, so cool. I suppose it's different now because you can just tweet at your favorite creators anytime you want, but back then this felt really special. All right, and that brings me to um, another one of my favorite books, another series that meant so much to me, The Books of Bayern by Shannon Hale. I love this woman so much. I need to give her like a theme song. Shannon Hale, Shannon Hale. Ooh. First of all, in flipping through this book log, her name appears several times. I have read everything she's written multiple times. It's all excellent. I recommend Princess Academy and Book of a Thousand Days. Uh, very good uh, fantasy fairy tale type stories. But the books of Bayern were so impactful that I, I swear I have like some core memories built around these books. The plots focus on political intrigue and war and diplomacy uh, and our main characters are some of the people who are gifted with elemental magic powers. Right at the beginning of the first book, Shannon Hale describes a world in which people can receive um, one of three gifts. You could have the gift of being able to speak to animals. You know, learn the language of the birds or horses. You could have the gift to speak to nature. If you can speak, to, if you can understand the language of the wind or a fire or of water, um, you can control it to a certain extent. And of course that comes into play with our main characters. But she also talks about um, the gift of people speaking or the gift of being able to um, get people's attention to convince them to kind of have that charm. And what's so amazing to me is that I feel like I have met people in real life who I'm like, they have the gift of people speaking. It's such a perfect way to describe those people who just have a, a charm or a flair and then just kind of get people around them to do what they ask. It's not necessarily a bad thing unless they use it for evil, but I do think that it kind of installed this mechanism in my head where when I would feel myself being pulled into someone's charm or being told just to go along with what the group was doing because someone said so, to have another voice in the back of my head going, do you really think this or are you just being uh, people spoken to? I really don't think I can say enough good things about these books. I think every young girl should read them. The second one, and a Burning, is uh, one of my favorite books of all time. They're written for children, but they're kind of allegorically dealing with some very adult topics. Like I said, war, poverty, addiction. And I'm gonna say it, we as a community don't give enough love and hype to Shannon Hale. I, I'm sorry, it's just, that's just how I feel. And all right, fine, now it's the moment you've all been waiting for. It's time to talk about the book series that I fell in love with 
and then the rest of the teenage girl world fell in love with, and then the world fell out of love with, and it became very cool to hate this book for a while. But that doesn't matter. Of course I gotta talk about the Twilight series! At this stage, I have no interest in talking about if Twilight is good actually, or if Twilight is bad actually. I am just obsessed with it as a cultural phenomenon. I first read these books when I was 12, and I was hooked. I got all my friends into reading them. I was thinking about Edward 24-7. The idea that somebody would come into my room at night and steal me away and fall in love with me in a meadow in the woods consumed my every waking thought. And I'm not going to apologize for that because it's a great premise. Regardless of what you think of the writing, I mean, this was a page-turning book. This was intense. The feelings between the two main characters were really intense. The danger was always ratcheted up to 11. I mean, it was like... And here's the thing. I wish that I could sit here right now and be talking to you like, yeah, I don't know if you guys remember Twilight. Like, it was a really, like, kind of dumb series, but I really liked it back then and it was so fun, right? Except I can't do that. I can't do that because liking Twilight or not liking Twilight became like a political statement. It became the defining thing to determine if you had taste or if you didn't. It blew up in the popular consciousness because a lot of teenage girls like that shit. And then the backlash was so much. It was so much that like a year after I read it, I like distanced myself from the whole thing. I was like, well, I didn't really like it that much. That was a lie. I fucking loved it. And look, I, I didn't think you're mean if you didn't like the book. You didn't ever have to like the book. It's just that like, it, there was really too much resting on Twilight as a whole. So where are we now? The hype happened. You know, the movies got made. Robert Pattinson hated his job for like seven years. We all promptly forgot about it. And then in 2020, out of the memeing ground comes all of this Twilight resurgence. And Stephanie Meyer says, you know what? I'm publishing Midnight Sun. So I feel like we're back on the Team Twilight train again. And I'm frankly here for it. I follow this woman on TikTok, uh, Magical Molly, I guess I'll link her below, um, who talks a lot about how Twilight is a perfect example of modern gothic romance. And I happen to agree with that. I think if you're gonna come on here and say, you shouldn't like Twilight because Edward and Bella's relationship is unhealthy. Yeah. Yeah, it's a book series about an unhealthy, obsessive relationship. Um, that's kind of the whole point. It's supposed to make us uncomfortable. It's supposed to be, uh, it's supposed to kind of push us to the extremes of our emotions. God, I just love the series. Every time I watch the movies or think about the books, I feel like it's fall again. I feel like I'm running home after school so that I can read another chapter in, up in my room. I feel like I'm daydreaming in class about hanging out with the Cullens and maybe asking them if they want to play baseball with me. I think the reason why Twilight was and is so successful is because it really does provide this platform on which so much imagination can happen. The world of Forks Washington is not just defined by its characters, but by its aesthetic, by its feel, by that sort of rainy, mossy, um, small town vibe. It feels so nostalgic to me. Here are some rapid fire answers to questions about Twilight that I assume nobody will actually ask me. Number one, yes, Robert Pattinson could still get it. Number two, I was team Edward all the way back then, but, uh, now I have a crush on Charlie Swan. Number three, the racism thing. I know that Stephanie Meyer's relationship with the uh, Quillute tribe um, is a fraught one. I know that her books kind of borrow and twist a lot of the sort of cultural practices of these people, and certainly she profited greatly from them. So I don't really think it's a thing that we can dissect right here, right now. 
I encourage you to go look out for a bunch of other Twilight hot takes, particularly uh, by Native creators, who kind of help to educate about these issues and also maybe present um, solutions. Uh, for, no, I've not read Midnight Sun yet. I would love to. I like, there's so many books that I, like, I feel like I need to read and I need to like physically own so that I can write in them. Otherwise, we're just gonna have to wait several weeks until it becomes available at the library. Me and my friends would walk home from school every day and it would take us like an hour to get from school back to our neighborhood and we would just talk about Twilight and what we would do if we were in the Twilight films. Oh my god. I know. But I would love to read a book that made me feel the way Twilight made me feel. So, so if you've been listening to me for this long, why don't you drop a comment um, letting me know if there's a book that you've read that fits that criteria. It's got to be fun and intense and full of aesthetic that feels like warm and nostalgic and uh, yeah. Thanks so much for listening to me again, you guys. Uh, the welcome that I have received from BookTube has been really fantastic and heartwarming and um, I, I can't wait to talk more. If you like these rewind videos where I go and uh, take a new look at the books that I read at a certain time, let me know because I could make a whole heck of a lot more of them. Thanks again, people. That's all she wrote. Have an excellent day. Some say that